In this particular session, based on the conversation uh, that I had with Joyce and Rosemary, was that we were just going to introduce the participants to uh, research methods, and then we will move to participatory research methods. The next week, we will get a little deeper into, um, uh, into the data collection uh, strategies and methods that uh, we can use. So that's um, for the part one and then uh, part two for data collection. And please feel free to ask any question in case uh, you don't understand or we can do it at the end as the program uh, proposes. Now, the, the, the context that we have here is creating safer spaces as uh, uh, Rosemary already introduced us to. And we are going to be looking at how we can use the participatory research uh, to uh, build capacity, empowerment, and engagement uh, in matters research that is oriented much more towards action. Uh, on this handbook on war and public health, established way back almost 20 years ago, uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, in terms of uh, the distinction between the situation of peace and return to uh, normalcy, it's in the middle here uh, that we want to create the safer spaces in situations of armed conflict. We want to limit the effects of war on, uh, on, on civilians, particularly. And we talk very strongly on civilian protection as a key component of transforming that particular situation. So the whole idea of uh, dissemination of strategies, for example, of humanitarian principles, which have been developed over the years uh, by Sphere Project and others, uh, do no harm principles, and also making sure that civilians are protected in these extreme situations of war and conflict. We also have, um, uh, which is uh, equally important, how we disseminate these particular principles and strategies of an armed civilian protection, uh, which is key in situations of uh, uh, violent conflict. So they just have this at the back of your mind. If you look on the top right hand part of the uh, of the diagram, you see there to encourage the return to peace, uh, creating buffer zones. And the strategy that has been used for an armed civilian protection has partly been that. Uh, you create a buffer zone by presence. Uh, that the presence of an international group of civilians within the vulnerable civilians uh, in, in conflict situations by itself creates uh, a, a very strong buffer zone. And also it creates a force that will move much more towards a reestablishment of peace. We're talking of vulnerability here from different perspectives. Um, one is that our intervention and strategy is on a peace intervention, that is an armed civilian protection. We are looking for new resilience in conflict. We don't want to look at uh, individuals that are in situations of vulnerability in conflict simply as victims. We also would like to consider them as survivors and, and that's why the strategies in uh, participatory research is to consider each participant in that particular research as a potential action giver and a social change agent. It's not somebody that is there necessarily to be helped, but somebody who's there to find a solution. And we'll be talking a little bit about uh, that in, uh, in the next few slides. And that's why I'm emphasizing here the whole issue of new resilience uh, in situations of conflict. And armed civilians uh, here, uh, within uh, situations of war and conflict, uh, we need presence uh, as, as a strategy to advocacy, uh, but also we need to develop uh, support mechanisms uh, as we build on the peace agenda. And, and the research is meant to gear much more towards that. Post-traumatic support. We are not dealing with uh, civilians in normal situations. We are in a very delicate situation when you are doing research among, amongst um, victims of violence or survivors of violence. Uh, you are likely to uh, to traumatize to re-traumatize them, even through your own research. So uh, the early stages of research in these situations of uh, vulnerability has to be handled very carefully within uh, clear ethical considerations. 
Um, campaign for inclusion of gender issues, definitely, uh, because uh, the participatory research aims to ensure that inclusion is key. And we, in these situations of war and violence, uh, women and children tend to be uh, most vulnerable and we need to pay special attention to that. Uh, lastly, we increase capacity and uh, increasing capacity is empowerment because we want to ensure too that the researcher and uh, the research participants are empowered by that particular experience of participatory action research. Now, let's look a little bit on what participatory action research is really about. Uh, out there, I was introducing the context of uh, this particular presentation. It is focused on planning and conducting research process with, and I do underline and italize the word with, uh, people whose life experiences and actions are understudy. And it means that these people uh, are part and parcel of change-oriented research. And so the strategy that we use for research inquiry here um, is that we not only question the reality as it is, but we use science and practice. Science for scientific data collection process and practice for action-oriented process. That the data that we collect and opinions uh, that, that we collect at the end of the research should gear us towards the practice, um, towards implementation and change. And what that means then is that when we talk of participatory, we are looking at the approach to inquiry. We mean a strategy towards research. Uh, what approach are we going to use? It's a methodology. It means we engage directly with the contextual reality. And it's not just what we think, but it's what the reality tells us. And then number three is an approach to collaborative inquiry. It's, it's not just the researcher uh, who is at the center of the inquiry, but it is collaborative, uh, bringing together as many uh, stakeholders as possible. What does it explore? It explores possibilities in life, saying to ourselves that to be a victim of conflict or survivor of, of, of conflict is not the end of the world, that there are other possibilities in which we can get out of it, that we don't need to be armed in order to bring the change. Uh, that's why we talk of an armed civilian protection, this protection without arms. Significance of life experiences. Every experience counts. And every experience is a building block to the next stage of uh, looking for change. Individual stories with the emphasis that every, uh, sorry, I've already said every story counts, but common knowledge production as well uh, between the researcher and research participants. And, and that's why participatory research or even participatory action research, which we'll talk about later, uh, tend to throw people off balance, and especially academicians uh, coming into this kind of field, uh, realize that they are no longer in charge. Uh, and that this is a common creation that we have to build between the participants and the researcher. We need also to develop another term that you need to familiarize yourselves with, a participatory research group, uh, which is also known as a project team, and it is this project team that will carry forward the entire agenda of the research. And project team is made up of uh, a, 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 people taking different roles as a researcher, as a research participant, as a um, policy maker, as a strategist, as a government official. So all these are part of um, uh, the project team uh, that we come up with. Now the question we may ask, so what is different? Is participatory research different from other research methods? And why do we choose these particular uh, research methods in engaging with people's daily life experiences? The principles are the same. The, the standard scientific method is, is as, as required in any research is the same. But within the participatory uh, research, we put much more emphasis on engaging with the reality and the participants. 
we see ourselves not only as researchers and research participants, but also as co-researchers and co-creators of knowledge. So it is it, what we say, what we call iterative, iterative, uh, meaning we begin with a conversation here in trying to understand this particular reality. We continue on then to uh, identifying the key stakeholders. We move on to understanding the, uh, the key issues of concern by these key stakeholders. And we again go back to uh, telling ourselves, so what do we really desire to bring here? So there's a lot of back and forth. Every experience of encounter within this particular research draws us into thinking differently about uh, the research experience. The process is very vigorous. Unlike in other research experiences, uh, it, the, the fact that it is vigorous and rigorous doesn't necessarily mean that it's superior, but it just means that we want to get much deeper into the issues uh, in order to be better prepared for the kind of uh, uh, life change that we are looking for. Lastly, that it's driven by life experiences and the desire to find solutions. And not only finding solutions, but also understanding perceptions, understanding attitudes, making a critique of those attitudes and perceptions, um, appreciating the given reality uh, that we have on the ground. So, so when we talk of uh, PR or participatory research, we are getting deeper into these personal experiences. And that's why I said from the very beginning um, that we need to pay attention not to re-traumatize uh, victims of violence, uh, but much more re reinvigorate their life experiences and show them that there are other possibilities in life. Uh, so just in a nutshell, uh, when we talk of the standard research on your left, or the traditional way of doing research, our emphasis is much more on learning about a phenomenon, whereas on participatory research, the emphasis is on learning from and learning with and learning about research subjects. So the research subjects are at the core and their life experience is really at the core of the research. In um, traditional research, objectivity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, research and subjects is valued. Whereas in this case, we are much more on subjectivity, on the subjective experiences of, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the researched participants. The researcher acts as a professional in the traditional way, uh, whereas in this other uh, form of the PR, the researcher acts as a consultant, educator, collaborator, uh, knowledge creator and co-creator rather than knowledge creator. Um, for the traditional one, you are an outsider as a researcher, whereas for, uh, for PR, you are an insider. You're part and parcel of what is being studied and the conversations that are going around. Um, then the subject have no one role for the traditional one, that is, you are the key researcher. Whereas here, the subject, uh, you are the key subject to be researched. Whereas for the PR, the subjects have dual role. They are both subjects and they are both researchers. Remember, they are inquirers and they are also, if you may want, uh, inquiries as well. Subjects are passive um, objects of study in the traditional one, whereas here the subjects are active. Uh, traditional paradigms lend itself to controlled experimental research studies, whereas in the PR uh, strategy here, the paradigm is much more uh, qualitative, ethnographic, uh, that meaning that you want to experience the lived experiences of the people. There's involvement um, in research ends when data collection is complete. Here I do my, my, in my traditional approach, I do the research and that's over. Whereas in this other one, I actually want to be part of the change that is being experienced within the research. And we want to move to the action point, not just to the end of research. Um, and also the research agenda is set by the professional in the traditional way, but in this other uh, strategy, research agenda is set by the constituents. That I don't go with my own clear objective of the research and this is what I'm going to do. I develop a conversation first and we'll be taking up those particular steps uh, later on. Let's look briefly at the types. There's 
so many types of participation, participatory action research. Um, and there are many that have emerged uh, over the years. The most common one in the 80s and 90s was participatory action research. Um, this one brings together participants to work uh, towards analyzing a problem and finding a solution. And that becomes sort of the main principal approach for the other types of uh, PR research. Uh, the second participatory rural appraisal, this has been very successful. Uh, many NGOs have used it in the development world. And the idea is to, um, if you recall, the strategy that World Bank and IMF have been using over the years had been determine the kind of, um, the kind of programs and development that a country needs. And they give you money and they say, for education, this is what you're going to do. For this, this is what you're going to do. And that's it. So you never really get to develop uh, beyond what the donor wants. Now, many NGOs in the 80s and 90s uh, came up with a different paradigm. They say, can we talk to the people themselves, identify the problems, come up with a research program, uh, with, a, with a, a development program, and implement it with the people. And we call this participatory rural appraisal. Direct development through consultation with the local people. Then there's also participatory learning uh, research, which is closely related to PLA, uh, participatory learning and action. Participatory learning is just, we, we are going to learn with the community. We are going to co-create the knowledge together and not see ourselves as outsiders. And then for the number four, participatory learning and action, the emphasis is much more on uh, research approaches that build relationships, learning, empowerment, analysis, and mark the last part, improvement of people's conditions of life. That becomes really key, that what we've learned uh, moves us towards empowerment and change. Now, <clears throat> when we talk of the uh, PR in all these methods and other methods that I've not mentioned here, the primary objective is research for social action and change. That's really the principle, that research is not research for its own sake, but research for social action and, uh, and principle. It is very engaging, and the method that you choose depends on the problem that you're addressing, or the problem that you're addressing determines the strategy that you will use for uh, for the research. So the, the common objective really uh, is to find a common solution to the problem. If you take an example of this, and there's a lot of interaction, uh, we do re also talk about participatory action uh, research, which, is, which means action-oriented research. Some of what I've already said, participation simply means collaboration, empowerment of participants. You need to demonstrate to them that they are not just victims of conflict or situations of conflict or vulnerability, but they also have a voice and ability to bring the change they desire. And research process is a co-creation of knowledge and we continue to build on documented lessons uh, that have been learned. Uh, in terms of action, it's not just action for the sake of action, it's action uh, that is based on real life experiences and is evidence on uh, the terms of different outcomes that uh, we do expect to emerge in that particular experience. This is just an example. I don't need to take you through all that because of uh, uh, time. Uh, this is just an example of uh, what you may consider as rural appraisal. Um, the idea here, if you look at the middle, is the mutual learning. That's the most important, that uh, both the researcher and the, and the participants from the rural area are learning together. And then here we are raising also awareness because in that process of learning, we begin to discover new things. If you're looking at the causes um, of drug abuse in schools, for example, we really get deeper into issues and we're going to learn together and we'll be surprised at the kind of knowledge that will emerge out of it. So the participatory research action or action research then will uh, rely on the tools of community empowerment. That we, we are saying that the community has to be part and parcel of the transfer of knowledge and uh, the development of action. That's why at the bottom there, we don't want to leave the community in the decision making process. The community has to be part and parcel 
of the implementation of the resolutions of the recommendations that come out of a particular research. So that's what I really wanted to emphasize there. Some basic prerequisites and uh, guiding principles for participatory action research is one, freedom of expression. You will find here that the, the, the respondents and also the key stakeholders have the right to speak their mind. And you as a researcher, you have a role to ensure that they actually speak their minds, even those who are quiet. And sometimes in traditional societies where men tend to dominate, you make sure that everybody is talking and expressing their minds. Uh, so this kind of democratic space uh, where we are all saying that we are concerned about the issues about the, this particular community and we are committed uh, to bringing the change has to be facilitated through an open dialogue conversation. Number two, how we select the participants is really important. This can't be um, overemphasized. And the reason is, once we have an idea of the issue that we want to address, we have to bring in relevant people to be part of that particular solution. Remember, this is a solution-oriented research. Uh, so you're not, you're not going to simply demarcate your respondents and say, um, um, that these, uh, for example, are the people that have been affected. These are the victims. And these are the people who have uh, been very strongly participating. And these are, no, 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 no. You, you need to be part and parcel of that particular community to engage uh, with them and find a common solution uh, together with the people. So the selection of the participants will be very important. And we're going to talk about it later on when we look at the stages uh, of uh, participatory research. Number three is community of practice. Uh, this is also a technical term that we use in participatory research. And what we mean here is that we look at those who are affected by that particular reality. For example, conflict survivors, post-conflict healing um, um, strategies, uh, refugee opinions on the education system in the camps, youth perception. We look at who are the people that we need to bring together for this community of practice. Uh, meaning that those who participated not only in the research, but also who are now willing to take it to the practice level. Remember what I said earlier on, that this process is both scientific and also relies on the practice for social change. Number four, creating safer spaces. And I think this is very important for an armed uh, civilian protection that People need to be willing to talk. If you're talking about, for example, uh, uh, insecurity in our location here, and we have an armed civilian protection with us, and we are looking at the threats to insecurity, you, you've got to make sure that your respondents or the participants are willing to talk and talk freely and feel safe enough to talk. This is very important because you need those communicative spaces, whether it's with two people, three people, five, uh, focus group discussion, whichever uh, system you're using, uh, methodology you're using, you need to ensure that those communicative spaces are respected and maintained. Another is the co-creation. Uh, we are still in the PR strategy or uh, key components. Uh, co-creation of knowledge that this process, as we engage in the PR, uh, we have to know that every participant co-creates knowledge. They are a knowing subject, what we call a knowing subject. That they're not there to respond to your questions. They're there to share their knowledge, which in traditional research, we, our emphasis is often on, the, um, on, on just the direct uh, the direct responses that we get, even within questionnaires. No. In this case, is that you're, you're dealing with people who are sharing knowledge with you. They are co-researchers. They'll tell you, let's go to talk and, and talk to the community leaders about this. And they're going to ask the community leaders questions. They're going to explore uh, possibilities of how to get out of the problem they're looking at. They're, they're going to be with 
pick you as a, a, a researcher, but as co-researcher in this particular case. So they're really key partners also for the final finding and the proposed action. Professional development, um, as you can imagine, this experience will be enriching both for the researcher and also uh, for the community participants. We will increase our pro professional knowledge on the ground. At the same time, the community will also increase its professional knowledge on the issue that is being tackled because we are getting deeper and deeper and we are using a scientific method to get deeper into the issues. So that's really, really important. Now, the question that has always been raised is whether participatory research actually can solve all the problems. Uh, and the obvious answer is no. The participatory research rather engages and reduces that particular space. We call that adaptive uh, problems. It, it tackles adaptive problems that we, we seem to feel this is insurmountable. Will the war ever end, for example, in South Sudan? Are we going to be in a situation where there'll be disarmament? Um, are our youth going to go to school and you know, get proper jobs like other parts of the country? Uh, those in, in Juba, for example. So people can feel so overwhelmed and with no window to look at because the problems are just so huge. Now, what participatory research does, it creates what we call a holding environment, meaning it attempts to reduce the distance between hopelessness and hopefulness between defeat and victory, between victimhood and resilience. So it creates that holding environment. There's something I can hold on to, and that is hope. Uh, that is my own capacity and, 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 and power to bring the change that I like to bring my own capacity to dig deeper into the issue, to create spaces of dialogue in order to realize the change that I like to, uh, to bring. So you're, you're getting this person. That's why I was keen on emphasizing that let's not look at uh, people who have experienced violence simply as victims, uh, but as survivors, and then the next level as agents of change. And it, it needs a bit of a shift in mentality when you're doing uh, uh, participatory research. There has to be that, value, uh, that, that, that shift of change. Uh, if you're only seeing them as, as, as victims, then even when you are involved in an armed civilian uh, engagement, you'll see yourself as you know, helping these poor people who really have no hope in life. And work. No, 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 no. There has to be a sh paradigm shift uh, for you to begin looking at them as key agents of change. So what the, are then values that will help us to get that paradigm shift in our own minds and, 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 and strategies of uh, doing the PR processes? One is that um, one of the key value that we have here is that um, the, the participation is first and foremost based on social justice. And as we know, uh, social justice is grounded on simply one main principle, human dignity, protection of human dignity, that every life is sacred and every, every life counts. And that you cannot diminish that anyone's uh, human dignity created in the image and likeness of God to realize his or her own uh, dreams in life. So the principle of PR is actually social justice. And the principle of an armed civilian protection is social justice. And so this links in very, very well. We also hold the belief in human capacity. We don't want to see people, as I've said earlier, as victims. No, we, we want to, to, to see them as human beings that have the capacity to realize change. And with that, we seek to attain social justice, fairness, and equity. PR also promotes collaborative work uh, between individuals, groups, communities. We, we, we promote this collaborative work uh, towards a specific change. Then we maintain both professional and public accountability. 
professional um, in the sense that it is scientific and uh, public accountability in the sense that we owe what we do to the community and to the public. And the, pr the process needs to be conducted in full transparency with right intentions for the good of the community. Collaborative research approach also is, uh, is based on mutual respect. Uh, as I've said earlier, uh, whether you're dealing with victims of survivors or um, particular constituents within the community is to see them um, with um, mutual respect. The other we ensure that there is informed consent as, 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 as a key strategy in this, that the people know why they're being involved in this particular research and that they've given their consent to be part and parcel of it. And this takes an ongoing training for us to create that consciousness um, about consent. We also allow for adaptation in terms of changing environment. Sometimes vulnerable people have to move. Uh, there's an eruption of conflict in one particular region. They may have to move. The research may have to hold on for a while uh, before we can continue. So that flexibility is very important. Also, uh, we need to enhance uh, power sharing. Uh, it's not just one-sided, but we share the, the power of doing research uh, together and we empower uh, the community members also to do the same. Uh, it has to be as participatory as possible. Even when you have the key team of stakeholders, you still need to make sure that the community is part and parcel of this. Also provide opportunity to develop skills through skill building, mutual inquiry, um, uh, mutual engagement. And this last one is also key, uh, organizational commitment. Is the organization ready to ensure that this particular participatory research goes or reaches its ultimate end. Accompanying the, the research team, remunerating if there's an agreement for remuneration, uh, moving on to the policy implementation with the community. This is, this is a very long-term commitment. And it may not just end with the funding, but it has to go beyond the funding into uh, working with the community uh, towards the next level of uh, social change. Now, um, I see I still have a bit of time. Yeah, so I'll take you through now the stages of participatory, in, in participatory research, uh, so that we just have this at the back of our minds, and even as we'll be doing the, uh, the case studies, to know why are we doing what, why do we want to do what we want to do, and why do we want to engage in what we want to do. Stage one, clarify the purpose of research. Be very clear on what you want. Uh, why do we want to do this particular research? We cannot answer this question alone. Even when you develop the project and receive the funding for it, you need to leave a very big room and window for the community to redefine the purpose of, of the research. Because you may be totally surprised uh, by their expectation and the strategy they want to use. Number two, identifying and involving diverse stakeholders. How are we going to select them? We will discuss that. Number three, building trust. Trust is key. Uh, as I've said, they're creating both safe spaces and a democratic space for uh, communicative in spaces or communicative engagement. Number four, building a common understanding on that particular research and where you want to take it kind of a common ground as a starting point. Number five is um, uh, identify research questions. And research questions not here, in, in the traditional research, we start with research objectives and questions. In the PR, there are four stages you need to deal with before you even talk about research questions. So it doesn't matter how clear the objectives of this project is for you, you still need to hold it until you've cleared these four stages. Then you can talk about um, the research questions. So let's go uh, step by step. Stage one, clarify the purpose of the research. Now, <clears throat> the research partners, as I've said from the very beginning, need to know what the research is about and what they need to address and the kind of change they like to see. One strategy of doing that is that um, 
we come together to develop a mission statement with the constituents of the research. And we say uh, our research statement is that at the end of this particular research, we would like to see this reality. What is the desired reality post research? It is that desired reality that will then establish the objectives and the actual research questions or strategies or data collection methods or whatever it is, develop your mission statement together with the constituents. And the goal is simple, is to identify the type of problem we want to, to address. Is it economic, environment, social, political, uh, or is it related to human trafficking or is it related to uh, displacements? And sometimes it could be social, environmental, and economic because it has diverse uh, perspectives to it. And so when you're engaging in that particular issue, you need to be open to a much wider horizon. Be very clear on the expected outcomes. And that's where I started off from uh, because that's what then takes us in a reverse process uh, to realizing the next stage. Step two, identifying and involving diverse stakeholders this is key, but how do I select a stakeholder? That's always a challenge for many uh, because you may not be very familiar with the environment. Uh, you may need to take time, yet the funding limit might be pushing you to rush things up. And in the end, you may end up messing it if, you, if, if you're not taking it step by step. So have some basic guiding questions that might help you here uh, in identifying the key stakeholders. For example, how is this particular person or group of people affected by the problem? If I'm clear how they are affected by problem, then I'll probably be able to say, I'm gonna include them in this process. How can the person or group contribute to deeply understanding the problem? Is this a person, if he's, he or she is brought in into the process, contribute to a much deeper understanding of the problem? How can the person or group contribute to finding a solution. This may help us in identifying the key stakeholders. If we are dealing with a situation of uh, war and conflict, maybe we may want to bring the survivors of conflict, perpetrators, victims, policy implementers and policy makers, law enforcers, parents, teachers, community leaders, government leaders. So based on what we found out in stage one, we will be able then to begin looking at um, the key participants. But the key stakeholders in this research, they need to know the benefits of that particular PR that you're bringing forward. They want to be part of the solution. For example, you tell them that, you know, um, we want you all to be part of this particular solution, ourselves as researchers and also yourselves as uh, co-researchers. We want to have a control over the issues that are affecting our lives. We don't want to be victims of situations. We want to be agents of change, right? Just like I said at the beginning. You may say this is going to reduce conflict to some extent, that if we have a level of interaction uh, for civil and armed civilian protection, that it's not only the foreigners protecting the local civilians, but the local civilians being part and parcel of an armed civilian protection as well. We want to verify assumptions. Maybe there are certain assumptions that have misled us to believe in an alternative reality that is actually not what is affecting the situation on the ground. Uh, stage three is building trust. And this is really key for the PR. In traditional research, even if you don't trust me and my agenda, I think most of you have done research um, in some places where there have been research fatigue. Uh, if, if you happen to go to Rwanda and talk about reconciliation, there's research fatigue. If you want to go to Northern Uganda, you want to talk about reconciliation, there's a research fatigue. Uh, if you want to go to South Sudan and talk about disarmament, there's a research fatigue. So, um, but you can still carry on that particular research even though people may suspect that there's nothing that will come out of this research. That's not the case for the PR. In the PR process, we are geared towards problem solving. So the building of trust is very important. You need to show that you are really interested 
in seeing the change and seeing it implemented to the process where you are even willing to stay on for the evaluation of the change that has been experienced. So that trust is very, very key. Number two is that all key stakeholders and key partners ought to be involved in designing the research project. Now, this is a bit tricky because in most cases, by the time we're getting to this stage, uh, the research is already funded, the proposal is already funded and we are clear what we want. But still, as I've said earlier, the key partners need to be involved now in designing the actual research project and how this, the kind of strategy they are going to use. So you need to have a full disclosure of the objective and strategy of that particular research, how you have selected your partners or how you're going to select the partners, the conditions under which the project has been funded and the means of remuneration and whether uh, people will be remunerated. <clears throat> In most cases, we do encourage remuneration uh, for the PR research because it's so involving and sometimes people have to leave uh, their regular work or uh, the kinds of activities that give them their daily income so some symbolic or sufficient where possible uh, means of remuneration. Otherwise, people may feel uh, they're being used for something that is hidden. Uh, building trust is fundamental here. Um, uh, even as we develop the research questions, which will come later in number five, as a key process that moves us towards um, the end goal. And it takes a lot of patience uh, here. Trust can also be built through informal gatherings, visiting homes, having an email list served. You begin to build a rapport with the community. You take your time. You don't go there and rush and say, I have, I have this research to do, let me 20 people. No, no, no. You really take your time to know the context, to know the people um, as, as you build trust. Number four is building a common understanding. And in this particular stage, Actually, um, it, it really comes after we've, we've, we've done the trust building because now we begin to talk about the issues that are affecting the community. We look at the divergent um, approaches and convergent approaches. We look at how people have interpreted the reality uh, that is before them so that with time, we develop a common understanding. But you need to be cautious uh, so that you, you're not just relying on the, domin the dominant voices. No, you're, you're taking into consideration the fact that there are divergent opinions on the same issue that you're trying to address. But this stage of building common understanding can only go maybe up to 70%, 80% uh, in my view, uh, because the, the more you do research, the more you develop uh, the diverse perspective to the issue. And that will help you develop an opinion or even a common understanding with your team. So you may have a list check of some of those things that you need to, to look into as you build that. Your list check might include, for example, language, something we may consider to be basic. What language are we going to? use for this research? What language are we going to use amongst ourselves as key stakeholders? What kinds of jargons, especially when you get into those technical languages, um, uh, terms, are we going to cut other people off by the kind of language we are using? So the technical elements of research, very important. So there's also need for technical and financial support, as I've already indicated earlier. So you have your own list check and you can have as, as many things as possible there that will help you to build uh, a common understanding. One possible method of doing that is that once you've gathered yourselves as, as, as key stakeholders, you may use cards, just little, little um, uh, simple cards that you, you may use, maybe size of envelope or just the usual cards that we normally have uh, organized for the meeting. So you can use the card maybe once you've distributed them, you ask them, in the next five years, in the next three years, what would you like to see? What change would you like to see in this community in the next five years? And interestingly, you're going to get a lot of good answers. Um, 
uh, because in most cases, people will talk about those things that prevent them from their realizing their lives fully. Insecurity, lack of food, lack of uh, employment, poor infrastructure, uh, lack of healthcare. So they'll, they'll tell you, we'd like to see this in the next five years. And then what would you do or are you willing to do to achieve that change or to realize that change that you'd like to see? You're now driving the person from dream to action. The first question is a dream, is a desire for the future. The second is the action to realize the desire. And that's part of the, uh, the uh, participatory research, geared to the action. You can also use charts, and charts are good for uh, people expressing themselves in, in different way if you're dealing with a community that is uh, able to write or even if you're using an oral system, people can still project and say what they think and somebody writes on the wall. Or they can design it in their own way. They can use role play. Uh, they, they can use storytelling as, as, as one you know, way of uh, getting oral communities to express themselves. They can also use diagrams uh, to show their flow of thoughts, to show how things are connected, that this leads to this and that leads to this and the consequences are this. You can use diagram to show divergent and convergent opinions and certain outstanding concerns. So this could just be one method you can use. We have to go by the context and culture and history uh, in order for us to, to be able to distinguish what works where uh, for who. Just as an example, if you want to bring a, a particular change and we have clear understanding and you go there as a donor or somebody who is going to see that particular uh, uh, change realized, and we say, okay, we've been able to do this and this and this and this in our community. We like to evaluate ourselves and engage towards empowerment and change. So one, um, the community may want to choose the direction of saying, with your ongoing support, we can make this evaluation a success. Or, so in this case, remember, the focus is on the evaluator, is on the provider, the money provider. But we can also make a shift and say, hey guys, we need to talk among ourselves, what do you want? And say, working together, we will make this evaluation a success. This is taking responsibilities. Because we realize we are part and parcel of the solution we are looking for. Then, if you want to go to the next level, it's not just participation, but empowerment. You remember we talked about it earlier, is that we have, we'll have help, yes. We'll get external help, yes. But the success of this evaluation is in our hands. And that's where the participatory research needs to drive the conversation. It needs to drive the conversation towards full responsibility for change that we want taking full responsibility for change uh, that you want. Even when there is a catalyst, the catalyst can be Strathmore uh, University to move towards that uh, particular change that you want. But the catalyst disappears with time and the community uh, takes up uh, the key issues of concern for them. The last stage I like to say here is um, identifying the research questions. Now this is important in, in, in the sense that uh, research questions, as you've seen the here, is a kind of an inversed process where other than begin with objectives and research questions, we are coming to stage five to identify research questions because remember, we've already are clear, um, we're already clear on the purpose of research we are clear on the kind of stakeholders we want to involve. We've, worked, uh, we've also worked so hard in building a common understanding of around the issues. So now we can say, what do we need to do? And how are we going to go about it? That's why we get then to the research questions uh, that we want to tackle. So for the research questions, they have to emerge from the list of concerns. If the list of concern was 
One, insecurity. Two, um, early pregnancies uh, among uh, our girls and particularly because of the armed militia that we have around. And then three, lack of access to education. Four, uh, water and food. So you've identified those key issues of concern. Your research questions obviously have has to address those specific issues that have been raised. Or you'll say, we have six issues that were raised. In order to be effective, we'll only start with number four. Or maybe uh, post-traumatic support, uh, psychosocial support to the, uh, uh, to the victims of violence or to the survivors of violence. So then the kinds of questions I ask are critically important. Uh, for example, maybe about school dropouts. I want to know why we have high uh, levels of uh, school dropouts. I could develop research questions like, I've already consulted, built the trust, identified the key issues for common understanding. What is the rate of school dropout, for example? What are the factors behind school dropout? What category of students are most affected? What strategies? have been used to address school dropouts. What have these strategies, why, sorry, Auntie, I meant to say, why have these strategies failed? What can we do to address this problem? So you may want to rank the questions if you want in order of priority, or you may want to use the funnel uh, approach where you begin with much more general questions and go to much more specific ones. So depending on the kind of issue that, and, and questions you're you are addressing, uh, creativity here will be critical uh, in terms of uh, finding solution. I know I have uh, just a few more minutes left, left uh, but I'd like to throw these uh, questions for reflection in terms of thinking about our own society today and thinking about the key issues of concern for us today? What is ringing in your mind? So I'll ask you to think about this, um, to choose one issue of concern in your society and answer the, quest the following questions. Uh, the issues could be on education, on trafficking, child safety, racism, ethnic discrimination, poverty, and all that. The question I like to ask then becomes, why do you consider these issues to be important to you? And if you are to rank them, what would you consider to be the most important? For a young person of the age of 14, is maybe just the fear of somebody ever getting a picture that she doesn't like and put that on Facebook or put that on Instagram. That is for her world, that is the biggest thing she really fear. What do you consider to be the causes behind this issue of concern? Who are the persons responsible for these issues of concern? How would you address these particular issues? How would you gather data to address the issues of concern. Because now you need information. You have a general knowledge about it, but how would you then um, gather the data that you need uh, to address these issues? And then what kind of a team would you want to put together in order to help you research this particular issue? And will this team help you to realize the objective or the goal that uh, you are looking for? So maybe I'll, I'll, instead of continuing, maybe I'll stop here because I see my time is up. Leaving us with these particular questions, and I know that for the uh, case studies, uh, these questions are not so much off from what um, uh, we'll be looking at in the next session, so that I leave some room for uh, question and answer, not uh, interfere too much with the program. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, over back to you again. Because.